marker. Day one of filming, and I'm just getting mic'd up. Now we're in Israel. Welcome to Hong Kong. Hello. And action. Before going to to the Alpha Weekend, I just I said I don't even know what's gonna happen, but don't expect me to become a Christian. I wasn't sure if if I was someone who could connect with God that way. Yeah, I was excited to go. I think that was the biggest change, like fear. Um, was I gonna be like left out out of it, or am I going to really see what everyone else is saying, or like feel it? As the weekend went on, I mean, it was Saturday night, and then, um, you know, we were, I felt kind of, almost the atmosphere and energy changing a little bit, and, you know, something was lifted, then something, and then something was applied to me, like, and removed, um, you know, a lot of anxieties and, and fears that I had, I felt, I felt, kind of, I felt went away. My experience with God was so good, like, I... I felt an overwhelming sense of his love. I was filled with like a sense of peace and uh, joy and happiness that I've like never experienced before in my life. It was like night and day, like different thing from coming to the Alpha Weekend and leaving the Alpha Weekend. I was just happy and smiling and like I just had joy. People were asking me like, wow, it really looks like you've changed. And um, yeah, it was pretty awesome. The weekend is so important because it's a time to get away from their normal environment, from the busyness of life and go somewhere lovely if possible. And then you have opportunity to spend lots of time with people, to talk, to walk, to eat together and to just to get to know one another. You can ask the questions that you've been longing to ask. And it's during the weekend that people sort of let down their guard and they let Jesus in. So it's an extraordinary time. But most important of all, it's an opportunity to experience the Holy Spirit. And it's the Holy Spirit who makes Jesus real to us. It's the Holy Spirit who gives us the experience of being sons and daughters of the Father. So it's a Trinitarian course. And therefore, the, the place of the Holy Spirit is very, very important. And the experience of the Holy Spirit, when you read the New Testament, is a very important part of the Christian life. I often say that the course is a bit like a jigsaw puzzle. Each week people come and they see a different piece of the jigsaw. And the weekend is a crucial part of that jigsaw. The opportunity to understand who the Holy Spirit is, what he does, and then to experience being filled with the Holy Spirit, experiencing God's love, for us. When we finish the talk on how can I be filled with the Holy Spirit, that's the moment to pray that prayer, come the Holy Spirit. Usually we give people an opportunity first, say if they're not already Christians, to pray a prayer of repentance and faith, and then we pray, come Holy Spirit, and we wait for what the Holy Spirit wants to do, and it's always different. Sometimes there's an opportunity, we give people to receive the gift of of speaking in tongues and then we might have an opportunity to sing in tongues together which is a wonderful way for people to receive that gift if they've never received it before and often guests comment that it sounds so beautiful and at some point if I'm leading it I usually say now with the hosts and helpers like to begin to pray for the guests and they're sitting next to them usually and then they just turn and begin to pray for them and to pray for whatever is appropriate, whether it's for the person to encounter Jesus for the first time or to be filled with the Spirit or to receive some new gift. But it's an extraordinary moment when people all over the room are experiencing God's love in a new way. I'm afraid we're rather fussy. We take our own pillows, because we quite like that. We even don't like to confess, take our own duvet. <laughs> And I always take peppermint tea and some very good chocolate. And you take a lot of dried fruit. <laughs> I'm not sure we want to give away all our family secrets. <laughs> For the guests, the Alpha Weekend can feel a bit like the first week on Alpha. Some feel a bit nervous, some are really excited to be there, and others really aren't sure what to expect. But as time goes on, people relax and really enjoy it. 
So our role as small group hosts and helpers is to welcome the guests when they arrive, to encourage them and to make it fun and to pray. When I was a student, I was a terrible cook. I used to survive on cereal and toast most of the time. But in the holidays, I worked as a waiter in a fish and chip restaurant in Oxford. Thankfully, I wasn't the chef, otherwise the restaurant would have folded overnight. But I used to take people's orders and deliver them to the chef. Praying for people on the Alpha Weekend is a little bit like being a waiter. You find out what people need and then you take their requests to the chef. And the chef is actually the one who fulfills the order. We're just like waiters, serving others by bringing their requests to God. A ministry means service. So prayer ministry is serving others through prayer. John Wimber, the founder of the Vineyard Movement, described prayer ministry as meeting the needs of others on the basis of God's resources. And what makes Alpha so exciting is the work of the Holy Spirit. And the weekend is one of my favourite parts of Alpha. It's often the point where things start to click into place for many guests as they experience God for themselves. My leader was very tall. He was very nice guy. He's still a friend of mine now, but at the time I didn't really know him. And he, on the Saturday morning, approached me and said, can I pray for you? And I said, no. And he went, okay and so that was that i you know resisted him and whatever else it was that came with him and then the next day he was you know you got to give him credit for perseverance because he approached me again and said can i in a similar kind of earnest face <laughs> can i pray for you and i said okay if it'll shut you up i guess you can pray for me the first word he said was he just said lord like that with his head bowed, and he clearly had been eating kippers for breakfast because I got this waft of uh, fish, yeah, which was a poor start. Um, he said, Lord, um, please bless Charlie with your Holy Spirit. And as he was praying, I sort of didn't want to shut my eyes because, you know, you want to be aware of what's going on. And so I was looking up at him, and I was aware as he was praying, I could see this Adam's apple. His eyes were shut, and it was, I was just staring at it. It was moving up and down. So that became my fixation. And then when I got tired of looking at that, he kept praying, I looked at the ground and I stared at this carpet and the carpet was truly ugly. Like one of those carpets where I imagined the board meeting they'd had about the carpet and the swatches and the big discussion, which is the ugliest bit of carpet we can find. And so those are my preoccupations were his Adam's apple, the carpet and the strong smell of fish. Um, and I wasn't particularly aware of any Holy Spirit or any kind of divine anything except my sort of wild thoughts and uh, defences. Um, and, uh, and anyway, after that I heard him say, Amen, and I just Amen, Amen, that's a relief. Um, and, uh, and he smiled and uh, he has this incredible nasal sigh and he just did this long, profound nasal sigh and I was relieved that he was pleased. He moved on to someone else and I was left to my own thoughts and time and, and I did feel genuinely a deep sense, a remarkable sense of peace. If you're running a weekend, most people arrive on the Friday evening and there's a short 10 minute introductory session. And then on Saturday morning, there are two sessions. Who is the Holy Spirit? And what does the Holy Spirit do with a coffee break in the middle? Then the small group is a little different from the others because we discuss a passage from the Bible, 1 Corinthians 12 verses four to 11, where St. Paul talks about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The passage mentions a number of gifts, including healing, which we deal with later on in Alpha. But we found that the most common things people have questions about are the gift of prophecy and the gift of tongues. The more time you can give to discussing these and allowing people to share their experiences, both positive and negative, the easier it is for them to engage in the session later on. People often ask, do all Christians speak in tongues? And the answer is no, not all Christians speak in tongues. It's not the mark of being a Christian. There's no such thing as kind of first-class Christians who speak in tongues and second-class Christians who don't. And it's not the sign of being filled with the Holy Spirit. You can be filled with the Holy Spirit and not speak in tongues. Nor is it the most important gift. St. Paul often puts it at the bottom of the list. So why do we talk about it? Well, the reason for this is that in the New Testament and in our experience, the gift of tongues is often the first of the more obviously supernatural gifts that people receive. As with all things on Alpha, people are free to participate in whatever way they feel comfortable. There is no pressure to do anything. But we do want to provide an opportunity for people to be filled with the Holy Spirit if they would like to. 
and to ask for and receive the gifts of the Spirit. On the weekend, on the Saturday evening, and on the Sunday morning, the prayer we pray is the most ancient prayer of the church. Come, Holy Spirit. And sometimes people say, well, why do you pray, come Holy Spirit? Surely the Holy Spirit is there already. Of course the Holy Spirit is there already. The Holy Spirit is everywhere. Jesus is everywhere by his Spirit. But sometimes we have a stronger sense of the presence of God, of the presence of the Holy Spirit, of the presence of Jesus. For example, Jesus said, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am also. Does that mean he's not there when you're on your own? No, of course he's with you. But there's a, a stronger sense of his presence when we come together. And when we pray, come Holy Spirit, what we're praying for is a stronger sense of the presence of the Holy Spirit. I remember the first time I prayed that prayer. Sandy Miller, who was the vicar of HTV, asked me to take on running the Alpha course. And I was really nervous about doing it, especially about the weekend, and especially what would happen when we got to the Saturday evening and prayed the prayer, come Holy Spirit, because I thought, what happens if nothing happens? I knew that John Irvin, who'd introduced the weekend to the Alpha course, every time John Irvin prayed the prayer, come Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit came. Wonderful things happened. People's lives were changed. Then Nikki Lee took on running the course. And I knew that every time Nikki Lee prayed that prayer, come Holy Spirit, wonderful things happened. People's lives were changed. There were amazing stories, testimonies. And now Sandy was asking me to pray this prayer, come Holy Spirit. And I knew that the Holy Spirit would not come when I asked him to come. So I thought what would happen is I'll come back to London and Sandy will say, how did it go? And I'll say, so sorry, Sandy, I did ask the Holy Spirit to come, but he wouldn't come. And my fear was this, although Sandy's much too nice to do this, my fear was that Sandy would then ask, I wonder why that was. What was it in your life that stopped the Holy Spirit coming? So before the weekend, I thought, I've got to, because I've got theology for this, I've got to repent of everything that I can think of that could stop the Holy Spirit coming. So I went all the way back through my life, right back to my childhood, back to the fact that when I was 18 months old, I threw the rattle out of the cot and I repented of everything I could think of. So I was spotlessly pure. I fasted, I did absolutely everything. But I still didn't think the Holy Spirit would come when I asked him to come. So when it got to the moment on the Saturday night to pray the prayer, come Holy Spirit, I shut my eyes because I didn't want to see the Holy Spirit not coming. And when I opened my eyes, there was this amazing scene. The Holy Spirit had come in the, in the most extraordinary and wonderful way. And what it taught me was this. Thankfully, it doesn't depend on us. It doesn't depend on me. Jesus said, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? That's all we have to do. We have to ask him. There's a well-known story in the Bible, in Exodus chapter 14, of Moses crossing the Red Sea. The people of Israel have escaped from Egypt, but when they hit the Red Sea, Pharaoh and his army catch up with them and they're trapped. And God says to Moses, in effect, I'm going to divide the Red Sea so that you can go through. All I want you to do is stick out your hand, your staff, and as you do that, I'm going to send a wind that'll divide the sea so that you can go through on dry land. Now Moses was probably thinking, well, what if I stick out my hand and nothing happens? I don't want to look stupid. Or maybe he was wondering, well, surely God can do this without me. The thing is, God loves us. He loves to involve us in his work. And actually, we don't have to do very much. We just stick out our hand and pray, and it's God who does the rest by sending his spirit. And we get to see what he does. I was crying with the joy. Uh, I never knew that people can people could cry in a joy. And I noticed I didn't just look different, I felt different. Everything had gone. It was as if someone had unscrewed the top of my head and just poured freezing cold water in and everything had been just washed out clean. Just overwhelmed. I didn't I've never felt anything like it. I felt overwhelmed with happiness. Clarity. Complete clarity. I knew exactly what I was doing. I knew exactly where I wanted to go in my life. Everything just kind of all my priorities changed in like a second. This huge wave of emotion came over me and there was a huge warmness around my heart, like when a heart is being mended. And I didn't know it then, but I know now that what happened is that I got filled with the Holy Spirit. Nothing happened, but then 
as I was talking to the pasta, I started to feel this energy feeling in my stomach. And it started to raise up and raise up and raise up and raise up. And I just broke out into uncontrollable um, tears. And I just sobbed. <clears throat> and I just... Right there. Because that was a change in my whole life. Every Christian has the Holy Spirit living within them. That's what it means to be a Christian. Paul says if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, doesn't belong to him. So every Christian has the Holy Spirit living within them. But there are times when we are filled with the Holy Spirit. Paul writes to the Christians in Ephesus, people who are already Christians, already have the Holy Spirit living within them, and he says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And the word he uses there is in the present continuous tense. It means go on being filled over and over and over again. We all need to experience more and more of the Holy Spirit. And that's what we're praying for. When you pray, come Holy Spirit, um, of, first of all, you might sort of think maybe nothing's happening. But then actually, if you watch people, you often see that this peace of God is, is starting to just rest on people. People are often feeling just the joy of the Lord or peace and sometimes there's quite a lot of tears and I think that is God just healing past hurts and just sort of dealing with stuff in our lives. Occasionally you see some more dramatic things, you might see some people shaking a little bit um, and you know sometimes people have even fallen on the floor but those aren't the things that are important. What matters is the experience of God's love. That's the, the main thing that the Holy Spirit does is to, to enable us to experience what it's like to be a loved, beloved child of God, to know that you are loved by God. So the manifestations themselves are not what we should be focused on. I would say it's a bit like if you fall in love with someone and you have tingling in your spine, the tingling in the spine is not what you should be focused on. You wouldn't sort of go off and Google tingling in the spine and try and work out how you can get more tingling in the spine. No, you would focus on the person, but on the relationship. And the, the manifestations are secondary. What's important is the love relationship. So we, we always encourage people to focus on their relationship with God, with the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And even if they're not experiencing very much, it might be that they have it is actually very profound. So it isn't always what you see that matters. Often it is it is some, somebody's life being deeply changed from within. It's normal that when, when we first approach the Holy Spirit, that there should be a reaction of our laughter uh, uh, or tears or jumping for joy or speaking in tongues. St. Paul says in the letter to the Ephesians, don't be uh, drunk with uh, alcohol, with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. So he, somehow he says that the effect of the coming of the Holy Spirit are uh, <clears throat> like being intoxicated. But uh, is be, this is a, a very special kind of intoxication which makes people stable, uh, not, not uh, uh, trembling. I, an old person of 81 years, as a priest of the Catholic Church, so the most uh, traditional person, encourage young people to heal to the Spirit in any way he, he, he will. Only don't try to... to uh, <clears throat> Uh, artificially, artificially provoke uh, uh, emotions, or don't be, uh, <clears throat> don't be uh, encouraged to do what others do, because the Holy Spirit is respecting our personality, our uh, unique uh, personality. So Im imitation, mimetism would be a danger. Uh, just being. Uh, receiving the Holy Spirit in the way he wants uh, to come to us. I myself, I must confess that the first time I was, I experienced this kind of presence of the Spirit, it was an irrepressible uh, desire of laughter. But I understood that this was a very special kind of laughter. I felt like uh, 
be, be shaken by the Holy Spirit. No, for us Christians, the Holy Spirit is a relationship, a person, a person. It's personal love between God the Father and the, the Son. And if human love can change the life of two people, imagine what does the Holy Spirit do with love in person when he comes upon a person and when he, he is accepted, welcomed, uh, there can be a, 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 a more <clears throat> rewarding experience that to experience the Holy Spirit. So here's four tips on how to pray for someone on Alpha. First, respect the individual. Every person is valuable, made in the image of God, loved by him. So. We don't want anyone to feel pressured or uncomfortable. We don't ask people to walk to the front for prayer. We just offer to pray for them where they are. So it's worth making sure that you're sitting near your group before the session begins. And we tend to say men should pray with men and women pray with women, just so people are more at ease. Ask the person if they would like to be prayed for. And if they say no, that's okay. Don't take it personally. There will be other opportunities for them to receive prayer if they'd like to. And if they say yes, then ask if there's anything specific you can pray for. It may be that they haven't yet given their lives to Christ, but would like to at this point. If they feel ready, you can help them by leading them in a simple prayer. Sorry, thank you, please. Sorry for what I've done wrong in the past. Thank you for dying for me, for your love and your forgiveness. Please come into my life by your Holy Spirit. The Why Jesus booklet that accompanies Alpha includes a copy of this prayer, which you can refer to if needed. They may want prayer for something quite personal, and if so, just reassure them that God knows and cares, and then just pray for them sensitively. Don't pray too loudly or pass on information that was shared with you in confidence, even as a prayer request. There's one exception to this. If someone tells you that they have caused harm to another, or are themselves at risk of harm or abuse, tell that person you cannot promise confidentiality and that you may need to tell your overall leader or pastor. And before you pray, you might want to ask if you can put a hand on their shoulder while you pray. And the New Testament talks about laying hands on one another as we pray, and it's a caring way to let people know that you're there to support them. Second, remember the Bible. When it comes to praying, you can often think, I've no idea what to pray. So having a couple of Bible verses up your sleeve is helpful. We always want to pray in line with what God has already said in his word. For example, if someone has given their lives to Christ and asked for forgiveness, but is still struggling with guilt, you could remind them of Romans 8 verse 1, where St. Paul says, there's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. There are some more examples of verses you might find helpful in your team guides. Thirdly, rely on the Holy Spirit. When it comes to praying, you can often think, I've no idea how to pray. And I love what St. Paul writes in Romans 8, 26. He says, in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us. The Holy Spirit helps us to pray. So make space for him to lead you and guide you as you pray. And don't be afraid of silence as you wait and listen to God. Prophecy in the Bible is less foretelling the future and more forthtelling what people sense God might be saying. As St. Paul says, we prophesy in part. In other words, we never get it exactly right. So if I have a sense that God might be saying something, I tend to say something like, I might be wrong, but I have the impression that God might be saying this. Before sharing it, ask yourself, is it in line with what the Bible says? And is it, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14 verse 3, strengthening? encouraging and comforting. If not, don't share it. But if it is, it can have a hugely positive impact on the person you're praying for. So go for it. I tend to keep my eyes open when I pray so that I can see what's happening with the person that I'm praying for. There's nothing more embarrassing than opening your eyes to find that the person that you're praying for has gone for a coffee. And intensity is not a fruit of the Spirit. So you don't need to pray in a special way with a special prayer voice or using special religious language. Just pray normally and naturally and watch what God does. Fourth, relax and trust God. After you've prayed for a while, you might want to ask the person you're praying for how they are doing. Sometimes people can have quite powerful emotional or physical reactions to being filled with the Holy Spirit and it can feel a bit overwhelming. 
On the other hand, it may be that they haven't really felt anything in particular and are feeling a bit disappointed. It's important to reassure people that God's promises don't depend on our feelings. In Matthew 7, Jesus says, ask and it will be given to you. So if we have asked, then we can be confident that we have received and everything that we receive from God is good. As Jesus put it, if you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? We just need to put our trust in God and his goodness. Everyone will have a unique experience on the Alpha weekend. And during the small group time on Sunday morning, before the final talk, it's worth going around the group and hearing everyone's experience. For some, it will have been a life-changing moment. For others, it will have been another step forward. And even if people have had a difficult experience, the important thing is to reassure people that what counts is not the short term, but where they will be with God in 10 years' time. We've had one or two people over the years, but very few who've actually not enjoyed the weekend, who've actually found it too much, have walked out in the ministry saying they're going back to London, they can't, can't cope with it anymore. But interestingly enough, um, certainly the people that I can think of that have done that, they have all had dramatic experiences later on. But on the whole, most people that we've had the experience of who have found the weekend very difficult, God is still at work in their lives. I can remember the first time someone in our small group walked out of an Alpha weekend on a Saturday night during the, the, the ministry time. Name uh, is John. John's wife was there and she had actually encountered Jesus for the first time in her life. She was filled with the Spirit. She really wanted to stay, but he insisted on driving back to London. And on the way back to London, he said to her, I am never, ever going back to Alpha. And I remember on the following Wednesday, there he was. And I thought, what? how has this happened? We went round the whole group hearing what had happened to the people on the weekend. And I left John to the end because I didn't know what he was going to say. And when I finally got to John, said, John, how, how did you get on? He said, I hated it. I, I walked out. I told my wife, Tanya, I'm never, ever going back to Alpha. So I said, well, do you mind telling us why did you come back? And he said, well, I missed you lot. And what he was saying is he really, without intending it, he had made friends with the people in the small group and that's what brought him back. And later on, he did encounter Jesus and went on, he and Tani went on to help in the next course and then lead a group. And he brought a cousin on the course and that cousin brought a brother and that cousin brought another brother and I said, to him, how many brothers are they? So there are eight brothers in this family. So we haven't quite completed that family yet. But the impact of, on John, who walked out of a, a weekend, was that he went on to become one of our best leaders. So, and I can think of three other people who've walked out of a weekend who've also gone on to be leaders on the course. So if somebody walks out of an Alpha weekend, we say, hooray, there goes an Alpha leader of the future. We hope you found this training useful and that you've picked up a few tips on how to pray for people on the weekend. There's no greater privilege than being able to pray for others and support them in their journey. And our prayer for every guest on the Alpha Weekend is that they experience the love of God, that they come to know Jesus better and that they are filled with the Holy Spirit. Now some of you may still feel fairly new to praying for other people. It requires a bit of a step of faith. So now is the perfect time to practice praying for one another so that you can get used to what it feels like to lay hands on someone and to pray, come Holy Spirit. God wants to use you to bless people, to speak through you as you pray for them. So why don't we pray now that God would fill each of us with his Holy Spirit to empower us to pray for others so that he can change their lives. Huh? Thank you.